Welcome to the final session of the day. On behalf of JLF Colorado, Festival Co-Directors Namita Gokhale and William Dalrymple, Festival Producer Sanjay K. Roy and all my colleagues at Team Work Arts, Boulder Public Library and the City of Boulder, we welcome you to this session of JLF Colorado 2021 Virtual Festival. The Limits of Growth, Shubhangi Swaroop, Sam Petroda and Bruno Messias in conversation with Marcus Mech. In 1972, a team of scientists from MIT used a computer model to come out with the Limits of Growth report, which predicted the collapse of the world by 2040. Just opposing factors such as population, industrial output, fertility rates, pollution levels, and food production, the report suggested that our continued exploitation of the Earth's resources and rapid industrial growth will lead to a catastrophic outcome. As the world locked down with COVID-19, it demonstrated how just a few months led to rapid regeneration across the planet. Does this perhaps mean that it is not too late to retrace our steps and begin anew? With the 2021 United Nations Climate Change Conference approaching, a session that evaluates the steps ahead and necessary short-term sacrifices that must be taken for the sake of our overall salvation. Shubhangi Swaroop. Shubhangi Swaroop's debut novel, Latitudes of Longing, is a work of ecological fiction that won the Tata Lit Life First Book Award and Sushila Devi Award for Women Writers. It is an international bestseller, currently being translated in 13 global languages. She was the Charles Pick Fellow for Creative Writing at the University of East Anglia, UK in 2013, and has won two largely national media awards for gender sensitivity in feature writing as a journalist. Sam Petroda. Sam Petroda is an internationally recognized telecom inventor, entrepreneur, development thinker, and a policymaker who has spent 50 years in information and communications technology and related global and national developments. Petroda has served as an advisor to the Prime Minister of India on public information, infrastructure and innovation with the rank of a cabinet minister and also served as the chairman of the Smart Grid Task Force. Bruno Messias. Bruno Messias is a senior fellow at the Hudson Institute and the Wilfred Martin Center for European Studies and a former politician in Portugal. The author of Belt and Road, History Has Begun and the Dawn of Eurasia he advises some of the world's leading companies on geopolitics and technology. Marcus Mensch. Marcus Mensch works on water, climate, and social changes issues in South Asia, the United States, and globally. Combining narratives of transformation and resilience in complex social ecological systems, he spans culture, art, and science in pursuit of change. He founded the Institute of Social and Environmental Transition in 1997 and obtained his PhD from the Energy and Resources Groups at UC Berkeley in 1990. All our sessions will be available to view on our Facebook page, JLF Lit Fest, and our YouTube channel, Jaipur Lit Fest JLF. Do follow our social media handles to get notifications on upcoming sessions. In these unusually difficult times, we have struggled to bring you JLF Colorado without charging a registration fee. Please support as generously as you can to ensure a free, seamless, and continuous flow of knowledge. Simply click on the Support JLF button on the right-hand side of your screen. Your contribution is greatly appreciated. Ladies and gentlemen, the limits of growth, Shubhangi Swaroop, Sam Petroda, and Bruno Messias in conversation with Marcus Mench. Over to you, Marcus. Well, welcome everyone. I'm extremely honored to uh, moderate a session with such uh, incredibly insightful and uh, innovative figures here. I think, you know, globally, I feel as though we stand on a great divide. And that divide is something we feel very intensely. I did an 800 kilometer long hike along the continental divide this year, this summer, uh, and felt that very, very personally. I've spent most of my life in the policy and technical arenas, but there it is very different to walk through 800 uh, kilometers of trees that have uh, died from uh, the combination of bark beetle and spruce budworm catalyzed by climate change. It is very different to talk to people 
who are young and old about their tensions and their angst about the future as they hike. Um, so there was, there's a very personal piece to this. I think the original limits to growth study was framed very much in resource terms and population consumption was criticized for missing a lot of the economics and the innovation. And there are wider questions of governance, global governance, local governance, of our relationship to nature, of uh, the demand for instant gratification that we all live in, in a world that is hyper-connected and, and very, where things are delivered instantaneously, and the way things um, transmit across regions, where we really have a question of both local and global governance in, in our face if we want to respond to many of the challenges that the Limits to Growth study framed. So what, the way I'm going to structure this is just ask our, our participants first to think how they would frame that question of the limits to growth, what they see as some of the most important issues facing us as a start. Give them each three or four minutes to, to talk and think. Um, and maybe what we'll do is, is start with Sam um, and move from kind of that hyper-connectivity, uh, his expertise in the telecoms, through the question of, of the Belt and Road and, and where Eurasia rises with Bruno, and then get a reflective response from um, Subchenge, who's, who's written about this from a very different perspective. Um, turn it over to you, Sam, for a, a few initial thoughts. Thank you, Marcus. It is indeed a privilege for me to be with you all. I had an opportunity to read the report that you talked about from MIT. Not that that report makes a lot of sense in every area, but I do believe that there is something to worry about. There is limit to growth in some areas. Take, for example, the fact that today we take 3 billion tons of earth material every year out for our industrial production, whether it is iron ore, lithium, magnesium, copper, or whatever it is. If we continue to do that, I see a day, maybe 50 years from now, maybe 100 years from now, where some of this raw material would be in short supply. You can say same thing about marine life, you can say same thing about water. But then innovations provide us some hope. However, I look at all of these things today from the viewpoint of hyperconnectivity. For the first time in the human history, we are all connected, never happened before. What does this connectivity really mean? Unfortunately, we use this connectivity to do the same things that, be, that we have been used to doing, as opposed to trying to do new things that we have never done before to take humanity to the next level. I'm 80 years old, and I know that the world was last designed just about the time I was born in 1942. That design led by US gave birth to UN, World Bank, NATO, WTO, GDP, GNP. That design was also based on democracy, human rights, capitalism, consumption, and military. Then world was bipolar. Lots of things happened after that design. World got decolonized. China could rise to a level no one had ever thought of. Soviet Union fell apart. Technology became pervasive, inequality increased, 9-11 changed American mindset, and finally COVID-19 put entire world to halt. What COVID-19 tells me is that we are all interconnected, interwoven, interrelated, and interdependent. Based on that, I have come to the conclusion that there are only two important things in life. One, planet, and two, people. 
planet is in pain because we have really overused some of our resources we have huge mountain of plastic junk in the ocean as big as alaska we have really destroyed some of our forest affected our birds bees and all that and that also should be seen as limit to growth in some way people are in pain because of inequality we do not have inclusive world very few people are very rich and lots of people are very poor so when you look at the old design i have come to conclusion that world today needs a new design what is that new design and we can talk more about it later on but the basic idea is to take democracy to inclusion take human rights to human needs we can produce anything we don't know what to produce because we wind up producing for people who can afford to buy and not for people who need it one of my favorite things is to say that world over best brains in the world are busy solving problems of the rich who really don't have problem to solve and as a result problems of the poor don't get the right attention we cannot go on consuming the way we have been consuming we must focus on sustainability and conservation capitalism hasn't served well for everybody we need new economy we need bottom up development we need decentralization we need to do lots of new things to change our economy from consumption based to conservation and sustainability based and finally i hope as mankind we have evolved to a point we can sort our differences across the table and not go on building nuclear armaments today we spend 2 trillion dollars a year on defense industry when we know that for 200 billion we can eliminate hunger in this world why don't we do it i hop in and 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 shift it to to bruno i mean i think that there's some key points you know the Thank you. the brilliant minds spending things solving the rich it was only yesterday that the first malarial vaccine came out yes. and that is more of a problem of the poor and it's one of the first Absolutely. times that anything like that has happened thank you bruno some of your thoughts on this i was struck by exactly the same sentence i i was going to say hopefully yesterday's news signify a new beginning and that we can focus on some of these problems that have been around for so long and no ability to focus on them for the reasons that sam very well pointed out now going back to that report it's from 1972 before i was born uh, 50 years ago essentially so it's a good time to think back to it uh, i think the report actually age well i mean there's something about it that is rather simple you use the computer model one of the first social science studies to use computers for um, forecasting the future so that was revolutionary as well of course the model is rather simple rudimentary there's something that makes you think of the 19th century of maltos the, the 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 competition between population growth and and agricultural production and so on but still one thing i think uh vindicates the report the the essential pessimism of the report has been vindicated over the past 50 years many people have attacked the report for being too pessimistic not focusing on technology enough technology was going to solve all the problems and i think now in 2020 2021 in particular with a uh, very difficult summer that we had all over the, all over the world and really the the beginning of the climate emergency for most people for television audiences i i i think that the summer of 2021 may be recorded uh, remember there's that in the future and that fundamental pessimism of the report has in that sense been vindicated the difference the, the you, you know we are in a different age from when the report was written the report was looking to the future in some cases the distant future we are already in the transition that's the remarkable thing that many of us perhaps are not aware we are already in this uh, gigantic transition from one economic energy model to another 
And the news from the past two, three weeks are very representative of that. Energy crisis in China, energy crisis in Europe, particularly acute, and an energy crisis in the US that is perhaps better disguised, but is there as well. Now, I remember reading somewhere that most accidents at home happen on the stairs, stairs between different floors or the entry stairs, the stairwells. Uh, it's, it's on the stairs, it's in the transition that most accidents happen. So we are in a particularly delicate moment. The transition is riskier and more dangerous than the initial starting point and the destination point. And we saw that in the past two, three weeks that many people got scared already. Speaking, I mean, I'm in Europe right now and I, I can tell you that many politicians, many officials are really scared by when they look at the numbers, the energy prices skyrocketing, and they want to go back. They want to return to the starting point. They're on the bridge and they want to go back. Uh, and the publics are going to also, in many cases, demand that we go back. So that's dangerous. That's not promising at all for our ability to, to deal with problems. Uh, two other points on what I think a transition means. First of all, I think the report from 1972 would be vindicated also in the sense that the transition is also a moment of, of scarcity, uh, perhaps managed scarcity to some extent. Um, did the report think about a transition moment? Uh, sometimes the report seems to suggest that we go instantaneously from the crisis to the solution or then to the collapse. But I think we now see there's gonna be a prolonged transition, a moment of managed scarcity, which is perhaps more difficult because if it is managed, many people are going to demand that we forget about it. Many people are going to suggest there really is no scarcity, that it's politicians that are creating it artificially. We saw that over the past week. But it is a moment of scarcity, as we see in Europe and China right now. And second, and that connects to my previous work and my previous books, it's a moment of intense geopolitical competition. Because the main actors suspect that we are creating a new world and they want to shape it. I'm very sympathetic to Sam's idea of redesigning the world. But I also want to point out that as inevitable as it is, this moment of redesigning, it's going to be a moment where the major blocks in the world are going to be locked in intense competition to see who can, in fact, redesign the world. And we're seeing that as well in the past two, three weeks, how China and Europe are now competing for scarce coal and natural gas resources. And this is only going to get worse. We're going to see uh, the main geopolitical actors compete for lithium, cobalt, nickel, in many cases in Africa, because the technologies of the future are also limited. This is not a utopian world that will solve our scarcity problems. Uh, green technologies also need resources, and those resources are limited. So in that sense, I think the report reads very well today, uh, and the, the fundamental pessimism, which was a call to action, is very useful today. And I think uh, the, the, the listeners uh, would do well also to, to check back on that report and at least read parts of it uh, as uh, helping in our wake-up call that we need um, urgently. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 I totally agree. And there's a fundamental resonance to what the report had to say. I think the, the point that is so difficult in this is precisely that question of transition and the question of the deeper time and how people, when they're going through different, deeper dislocations, can relate and absorb those um, so that we actually move in a productive way rather than in a, just a structuring of more competition. And I think, Shubhtangi, your writing has real insights on some of those connections and some of that question of time and uh, and transition. So, you know, your reflection, I know you're not, you know, haven't been central and the report itself hasn't been central to your, your background, but that question of, of the limits to growth and what we're doing to the planet and how we can reshape that is something that I speak, think you speak very, very profoundly to. Thank you. Yes, well, what I can focus on is uh, the point that Marcus raised, uh, earlier, which is the report raises profound questions, but what about the possible solutions? I feel that art used to perform, and I hope it still performs a revolutionary role in that. It has the power to heal, to reflect, to rewire our brain sometimes. You know, stories can seduce you into looking at the world in a different way. But right now, our stories are more about 
entertainment and instant gratification as uh, amitav ghosh helped me understand through his book great derangement that climate change is not a natural degeneration like you know arthritis which comes or something with age or it's not bad luck it is deliberate and pernicious and our stories are partly responsible for the state of our world uh, state of affairs today so um how do i as a writer try to tell the story differently in the hope of shifting the framework for um, us readers too um well i wrote a novel called latitudes of longing and uh, i would describe it as a creation myth based on science it's literally trying to balance my left and right brain if i may say and uh, i let earth history decide the stories i tell and how i tell them to give a simple example i chose a tectonically active fault line in the indian subcontinent as a narrative thread and this is because uh, you know for far too long at least my entire lifetime i've had political borders shape and limit my empathy and my stories when actually my borders are pro- as old as my father compare this to the himalayas or the seas which are at least 15 to 20 million years old or way older and that is a more formidable way of shaping our imagination so um, this is literally a way of broadening our framework and looking at uh, you know looking at the story this way i was able to treat all life forms as characters not just human beings because human beings let's remember are just one species among all of um, in the entire ecosystem and it also helped me focus on patterns instead of a plot because when you zoom out and you look at deep time or look at the world through deep time which is the earth's life uh you are likely to see patterns instead of a simple limited plot of just cause and effect within a few years that's that's i mean i i think that that's that's a key sort of point within a, the the question of time in here and the question of instant gratification and the question of the stories we tell i mean bruno and sam um if you think of that in terms of the the curb- current challenges of global governance the current you know the the hyper connectivity the the rise of eurasia the shocks that we're going through the declines in trust how would you see changing the narratives the stories that we tell to give a different vision of the future that is has the same resonance as say the uh, the limits to growth where it it tells something it's a story but it tells something that really speaks to the truth is authentic at a, at a certain level either thanks, one of Marcus. you thanks markus it's a good question um taking link from what bruno said today world has two visions american vision which is based on the last design take it forward and the chinese vision based on belt and road initiative both of these visions are based on command and control today if you look at global conversation it is all about geopolitical equation trade finance markets resources and military what we need is a third vision of the world which is basically focused on collaboration cooperation co-creation vision that takes everybody on the table for networking vision where global leaders of g20 g7 when they meet they don't become marketing agents and trying to sell their country they have to look at what is good for planet and what is good for people we need a vision which says sustainability is more important we need a vision that says inclusion is more important how do we promote non violence why are we all fighting i don't get it look at what we did in afghanistan look at you know when i was young what we did in vietnam iraq everywhere i think we have to realize that we need a completely different model and that model is based on hyper connectivity to network nations network people like us 
network resources and really collaborate i think time has come for leaders of the world to recognize that what is good for america is not good for the world what is good for china is not good for the world what is good for the world is what is good for everybody and we need a new conversation on third vision of the world i think it is possible to do it but you can't do it in vertical silos you can't say only sustainability is the debate only military equipment is the debate you got to take five key issues that we had democracy must be taken to inclusion democracy in india is not inclusive is not inclusive in america we need to focus on human needs we can eliminate hunger in the world we can reduce poverty we have all the technology capabilities production resources to do it when are we going to do it sustainable development goals talk about it great idea but nothing happens same thing happened to millennium development goals we need really new economy economy that doesn't really work from top down but it works from bottom up localization globalization can stand side by side unfortunately we have given understanding of silos to everything democracy dictatorship liberalization control that has to change so bruno you know if if you were to reflect on that i mean one thing i saw on the trail uh was just a reorientation of many of the young people is it something coming from the bottom up people not wanting bigger wanting smaller wanting compact and wanting more con- connectivity that was a source of optimism for me along with the seeing of the regrowth of trees in places where things had died yep. but is it a bottom up you know how does one think of that transition yes it it is a moment i think maybe all of us on this panel agree of deep transformation our problems today are not going to be solved with small tweakings in our energy policy right it will require a a a profound transformation and you know that's bad news on the one hand but it could be very good news on the other it is an opportunity uh let me quote uh, amitav gosh as well since <laughs> uh we've already spoken about him um the rumor the first page in in the great derangement uh how he talks about how we had for the past few centuries an understanding of nature as something passive inert completely under our control and in a way that's the original scenes of the, uh, the original sin of the natural sciences all the natural sciences share this understanding of nature as something inert and i think here is precisely the point where we need poets we need novelists they actually have carried through the modern age still the old idea of nature as an actor nature as having power of its own that we cannot fully master and we cannot fully control for me the pandemic was a very vivid experience of this because suddenly it wasn't about the united states it wasn't about china the superpowers were reduced to a middling size and the real superpower in the world was this tiny virus all the virus particles in the world i checked they can fit in half a coca cola can wow. look what it's done look what it's done to our lives completely turned them upside down so i think uh, it's much easier for a poet or for a novelist to have this new understanding of nature we need poets and novelists as part of the discussion on climate change and we need to recreate our way of regarding the the external environment uh, from the top up from the from from the the bottom up i think that's a, that's the challenge and as you say marcus uh, the hope is that the younger generation can do this easily that we can because i look around and i see enormous resistance to any kind of change and people still there was a response to covid because people believed correctly probably there was going to be a 2 3 year challenge but all throughout the pandemic i was thinking if we had a similar challenge but no promise whatsoever that it would be temporary or that it would last 2 or 3 years climate change how would people react and my response was always well not well at all not well at all right well and that's to me the the place where on that more individual level I get elements of optimism is of young people actually reacting well and rethinking their lives and thinking their footprints 
how it aggregates yet is beyond me. But I, I think that question of also nature as not a passive object to be acted on, that's one that you should be saying speak very passionately to. Well, um, I would, you know, my conversation is literally leading from everything that all of you have said and it uh, the challenges that stories currently face resonate with the challenges that all of you have raised so if i can point out literally to the brick and mortar of it um one big um, i blame our stories especially mass media stories like sci-fi films for conflating all of human survival with the survival of all life forms it's almost like you know um, in these George Clooney and Christopher Nolan films, you have these barren landscapes of ice and dust to show that human civilization is dead. But that doesn't mean all of life is dead. You know, as Bruno pointed out, if half a Coke can is enough to, you know, have all the virus diversity out there, then let's stop treating these landscapes as inert and let's... Um, it's a big hit on the ego, you know. We would like to think that if we go, everyone goes, but that's really not true as... Earth history has showed up, you know, maybe another species will take advantage. And um, I suspect this also begins with our lack of understanding of deep time. Right now, we are living in instant gratification. So I read this, uh, a study of American University students, which said that the students find it dif difficult to grasp Earth time or geological time. And even the students studying STEM subjects are uh, unable to grasp the magnitude of the Earth's time scale. And that's because our frame of reference is always our own life, which out here is quite limiting. And this is literally something that was a huge um, challenge towards even writing for me. I found it very difficult to think in terms of Earth time because let's be honest, it eventually points out to my own insignificance and mortality, you know, in the life of this earth and all the transitions it's taken place. I am nothing. I'm, I'm, I'm lesser than an ant probably. So it's confronting the human ego, you know, climate change. We would like to think that everything is at stake, but it's pretty much only us that are at stake. And this question that Bruno spoke of that Amitabh Ghosh starts his book with of sentience, um, uh, I don't know how we reach these conclusions that the elements are inert and frogs and worms are only good for lab experiments. I feel um, this kind of thinking has justified our exploitation of it. You know, I, I can justify putting toxic substances and plastic in the sea because I think it's inert. It, you know, it doesn't carry life the way my womb does. Um, so I, I dream of reframing our conversations in a way where my sentience is reflected by my non-violence, like Sam speaks, or my non-exploitation. Let our sentience and our, the, our level of consciousness be defined by how we act and not use it to justify and plunder the way we did, you know, with particular stratas of society, or we still do. So these are the challenges in, in a nutshell that I face. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that that question, I mean, it goes back as well to the question of, of uh, that Bruno raised of, of we're able to respond to COVID because we see it as a short two or three year thing. Climate change is going to be, you know, what we put in train is, is, you know, at least a thousand years. It's well beyond any of our individual lifetimes and it affects all sorts of, of fundamental systems. And I guess a question would be, you know, is the, the sets of narratives that we create, are there ways of telling stories that have the, the um, authenticity and, and lastingness of, say, the limits to growth, the points that it made, this, that story, but, but point us towards a solution that can grow from the bottom up, you know, that, that can... Uh, actually enable a broader reflectivity towards society. Um, you know, Sam, you come from a hyper-connectivity perspective. You know, we've been hyper-connected if you look at the, at the, uh, the Spanish influenza, um, you know, but we see it more and we're more connected more quickly now. 
do you see pathways for, for having the narrative that you've espoused grow? I, first of all, I want to warn all of us that climate control is not going to solve all our problems. It is a major challenge. But let's not hang our hat on climate control to get us out of this mess. We need complete redesign. The value systems are all focused on capitalist mindset. Value systems are focused on command and control, geopolitical equations, military. That has to change. Nonviolence, inclusion, new economy, human needs, all of these things have to go hand in hand with sustainability and conservation. You cannot take things out of isolation and hope to solve a problem. I've given a lot of thought to this. You know, I reviewed my own journey in hyperconnectivity for the last 55 years. And I believe we have a major, major tool today, which never existed in the history of mankind, where everybody is connected with everybody to look at all the problems simultaneously. Yes. I think that's key. I, I, think I, I don't want to cut you off, but we have less than five minutes. And no. I do want to make sure that, that Bruno and, and um, Subchenge have, you know, I think that that point of a new major tool, Bruno, thoughts? Well, for me, the past, the past two or three centuries, we've been completely focused on the project of acquiring more and more power, placing more and more power in the hands of human beings. And we've forgotten to ask the question of what this power is for, yep. what human beings are, what do they want the power for. You know, the question of having more power is not enough. It doesn't answer the questions of how to use it and what it is for. We have to return to those fundamental questions. And if there's a moment when our power turns against ourselves, I think it's the moment to realize that that was not enough. And by the way, this criticism applies to the West and applies to China. They just have different ways to exercise this kind of full control of our destiny, full control of our societies. But the question of what is the human being and what is our life for? That's a question we haven't asked in a long, long time. We almost forgot that the question exists. So we have to go back to it. Right. You know, and I, I, I see that so strongly. I think of uh, Ruth Kimmer's book on reciprocity and the whole relationship, which is a real rethinking. And that to me is a fundamental piece. Shubsheng, is a few final thoughts on, on this before we end, before our time is out? I mean, um, the point of what is life for has already got me thinking, you know, as, a, as an artist, because that's where I guess our, if, if we can, you know, uh, rediscover more authentic forms of storytelling it will probably help us answer those larger questions uh if we you know uh bring back our folk tales our creation myths our oral histories as complementary to science rather than conflicting then it would also help us look at other possible ways of um, comprehending the world with the principles of reciprocity and non-violence that we have discussed and um Lastly, I, I really hope that um, I can replace the fear and despair with some kind of love and awe and greater understanding. Because um, if, I, uh, if I can be deeply personal, I became a mother at the beginning of the pandemic. I had a severe postpartum depression because of just the way things turned out in the first few months. But I still had to show up for my child and I still had to do what I... I still had to act out of love. So this, I, I can relate to a planet being in transition that Bruno speaks of and how crucial it is to sort of uh, come out of it in a healthier way. Yeah, I mean, and I see that question of, of, of the stories and the narratives, um, you know, walking again, hiking the great divide and thinking of the transitions that we're all going through. There were these, these elements of optimism and these elements of, of uh, you know, 
the real change in one's face, the pessimism of, uh, of it, seeing the, the, the impacts we've had on the forests and the, and the changes there. So it's, um, I still have a challenge in seeing, you know, how we actually create those narratives. And I think that that is where perhaps some of the hyperconnectivity, you know, seeing if we can actually have a more collaborative approach to narrative creation. You design the um, world. Redesign yeah, the world. Yeah, redesign the world and, and think of those those patterns. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So um, you know, to me, this leaves me with a sense of 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 both the real challenges that we face, um, but also that there are some places we haven't explored of optimism. And it's in the connectivity, the tools we have, the visions we have, the creative the the stories we create. Um, and you know, I think that that's that's one of the the beauties of a and challenges for all of us as writers, artists, and policy thinkers. You know, if there are key points, please hop in. But no, otherwise, thank I think you, Marcus. We've thank you for our time. No, I would say thank you for bringing all of us together. This has been a very interesting conversation, and. I firmly believe that young people will have to demand change. Change is not going to come from older people. Right. They are happy. They like status quo. They want military power. They want command and control. It is the young generation that is going to say, hey, we want collaboration, cooperation, co-creation, connectivity, networking, new order. If they don't order, demand new order, order they will not, not get new because order. we see the light, but because we feel the heat of the young generation pushing and of the it's their world they have to create they cannot rely on us i think we have messed it up yep. so can we so begin with understanding the education system i mean you cannot take one thing you got to do the whole thing it's a big world okay education people will have to design education health people will have to design health environmental people will have to design environment you know water people will have to redesign water systems it is not about one project. It, about, it is about getting humanity to redesign everything in their sphere. You know, we need to innovate at all level. It is so not we're going to be at thing in the education while everything is in a mess. Yeah. There is right, enough so resource in the world for us to be able to do everything, provided we are ready to rethink, redesign. Everything needs redesign today. And that's the starting point. Good. Well, I think our time is up and I really appreciate everybody um, and the thoughtful conversation we've had. It's been a real honor. Hope to Thank see you. you all in Jaipur. It was Thank a pleasure you. to see so, so, so many overlapping thoughts, but also new suggestions. Uh, I hope to meet you all in person in, in Jaipur or elsewhere. Yes, or, in or in Portugal. Or in Portugal. Thank you, Shabhangi, Sam, Bruno, and Marcus for a fascinating conversation on subject of critical importance, providing some much needed insights. Thank you all for watching and being such a great audience. We encourage you to buy the books of our speakers that are available at Boulder Bookstore. If you like the session, do consider supporting us through the support JLF option button on the right hand side of your screen. We sincerely value your contributions. Once again, we would like to thank all our official partners. We hope you all enjoyed these conversations and will tune back tomorrow for the session, Becoming Ourselves, Journeys of Discovery, Rajiv, Mohabir, Samra Jafar, and K. Ming Chang in conversation with Wang Mai Parakla. Introduced by Sylvan Fabi, Consul General of Canada in Denver at 9 a.m. MDT, 8.30 p.m. IST, 10 a.m. CT and 8 a.m. PT. Thank you once again and tune in tomorrow for the final day of sessions at JLF Colorado 2021 Virtual Festival. <laughs>
festival like this is a beautiful indication of the kind of uh, thing that I, I truly, truly believe in and I think makes our society uh, more whole and more pure. We do not take it for granted that Boulder was chosen as the first North American uh, satellite festival. Um, it's a huge honor we will not forget and we are enriched because of it. We are indebted to the, both the local and international people that came together to make that happen. And um, we hope it's a tradition that continues for decades to come. Literary festivals like this one build up an environment and an ecosystem to nurture readers and to promote the business of books. They provide an invaluable forum for writers to connect with other creative people. Uh, we sit there peering into uh, those uh, electronic uh, uh, grids in front of our eyes uh, and it only increases the desire to hit, see the real thing in the flesh, uh, to actually hear an author speak firsthand, to read from their work, to hear the tones of their voice uh, modulate as they read their most treasured passages of prose. Uh, for us it's special, this was our mothership and it continues to be. The other editions that we have across the United States are smaller versions, different programming but smaller versions. sense to me religion and art are the same thing they're vaguely irrational but they help make sense of things someone who lives with no arts and no religion has very little to live on 2019 was the 14th consecutive year of decline in global freedom you have to think of viruses as intelligent machines as code crackers and like all living forms they have to adapt to their environment imagination is a powerful tool it doesn't matter which part of the world we are in our situation. Are we behind locked bars? Are we roaming freely independent thought and process? Our imagination allows us to soar out of any present circumstances that we find ourselves in. And that really is the power of literature and the written world. It allows us to envision a better future. It allows us to consider our past and make sense of the present. Imagination is a tool to be able to free us from the binds and the constrictions that we find ourselves locked into. We can break free, we can soar through the universe, we can rise up into the darkened night like a firefly, illuminating the world. This is what JLF Code of Colorado hopes to bring you something to fire your imagination.